Today on our show, we man, got another guest in the cave. Dudes, get ready to pull your weenies. It's Paul Dini. <laughs> look at him, look at him, man. Oh. Tug, tug, tug. Come That's a great intro. Us. Thank you. <laughs> Paul Dini, all day, right today on Fat Man on Batman. <laughs> What up, kids? Welcome to Fat Man on Batman. Oh, we're doing this one. Welcome yeah. to Fat Man on Batman. I'm Kevin Smith. Mark Bernard. Uh, go to the free shot because everyone knows he's there. Yeah. Hey, hey, look at this. You asked for nice. class. We brought you class. <laughs> it's fucking Paul Dini in the hizzy, man. Anybody worth their salt in genre land knows exactly who this guy is. He's got a list of credits longer than your fucking dick. But let's just start with the biggest one that right now fucking means the most because Suicide Squad's about to come out. Yeah. Harley Quinn, baby daddy. One half of Harley Quinn, baby daddy right there. <laughs> yeah, that's there. right. That's You're right. looking at him, man. There ain't no... The best half. Exactly. There ain't no... That, well, let's not get into that. <laughs> Dude. Well, some people get shitty about that. <laughs> who's the writer? Who's the artist? Whatever. They're Harley I Quinn exists. I was just exists. going top Harley Quinn exists. Is that what it was? I was, it was a sexy top thing? I was going sexy time. Yeah, yeah. I just didn't want people getting into a Stan Jack thing. No, we didn't need it. We love Paul. We love Bruce. Everybody loves Paul and Bruce. And Paul and Bruce got together and made a baby... Yeah. 20, how many years ago? God, uh, 25 years ago, 26 years ago oh, now. What year 26 years ago, count. named Harley wow. Quinn, Harley and now Quinn. she's just ready to be born to the mainstream. 1990. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's when uh, that's when I dreamed her up and you know wrote the first script with her, and, and then uh, and then it, it took like two years after that for her to finally get on the air. You know, animation takes a hell of a long time to get mm. going. But yeah, around then, so 25 years ago. So Show him your six. big animation wiener. Give him a single as he lists his many jobs, starting from Fat Albert. Go. Uh, Fat Albert mm -hmm. worked with, uh, with with Cosby, and that was that was a delight of my of my early years. You know, because it's Bill Cosby, and I'm you know like 21, and I Bill Cosby, and it's like oh kid, and uh, and I got to write Fat Albert, and it was like I was just in awe of him because you know to Russell, my brother who I slept with, which and is everything. an amazing, amazing, amazing comedy, all album. this stuff. And I would listen to him, you know, every night, and the fact that I, my first job was writing Fat Albert, it was like. So so great. You know, Cut to the present. Well, so <laughs> life takes interesting turns for us all. And, and, um, but that was the first gig, and that's a huge yes, gig. Yes, that yes. puts you in the world of filmation. That was right. Yeah, so film then where do you go from there with Fat Albert? Filmation led to kind of like, I started working here and there. Hanna-Barbera, Ruby Spears came back to filmation, worked on He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. It was just a clump of plastic. They were saying, well, we want an animated show about this. So I was going down to Mattel, and I was going like, you do know it's all the same doll. You know, it's, he's got the <laughs> Same, same body as Skeletor and, and, and man, and, oh, shut up, shut up, shut up. We're making these quick and cheap. And and evil ends the same body as a sir. Shut up, shut up, shut up. We just changed the heads. So uh, we've got all these giant thighs. What do we do with all these giant thighs? <laughs> exactly. All those He-Man figures look like my mom. They all have my mother's thighs, thunder thighs, <laughs> childbearing hips and yeah. good thighs, strong uh, thighs. thighs. Yeah, even He-Man. I mean, they have the the best childbearing thighs. How <laughs> deep were you into like? Were you there for the building of Eternia? Did you come up with names and stuff? Yeah, I came up with you know some of the sideline characters and stuff like that. Like he needed a sidekick, so he came up with Orko. Yeah. And I remember when they were drawing up, I said, uh, you know, put a big O on his chest. And they said, is that O for Orko? And I said, no, that's the show where money we're going to make from creating this character. <laughs> we're going to make absolutely this for coming up with this, and they'll make dolls out of them and everything. So, uh, uh, but uh, you know, some sideline character. Actually, I came up with really weird ass characters, and then they later made toys out of them, like a couple of years. Years ago, I came up with this character called Plundor. This writer, uh, Warren Greenwood, and I, uh, we said, let's send He-Man to a weird world where there's a giant bunny rabbit who's just evil. And it's like, okay, great. Yeah. And they came out with a fucking pig <laughs> figure, fucking Plundor. They did it. They yes. finally did it. And it's like big dumb rabbit, you know. And uh, I think we were kind of inspired by Matt Groening's Life in Hell. Like, <laughs> what if, uh, what if you met Life in Hell rabbit? And of course, we couldn't draw that, so we came up with a, like a warrior rabbit. And and. Uh, it's so stupid, and they made a figure of it. And I, I looked at it once in the box and put it back and just put it away in shame. Like, <laughs> what the hell are they doing? Um, all right, so He Man, what do you do after that? He Man uh, went up and worked for George Lucas at Lucasfilm. Money Walks and Droids. That was a lot of fun. That was kind of like Skywalker Ranch Film School, just there for four years on the ranch. It's sort of like the fairy kingdom, you know? Uh, he's making Willow and Tucker and stuff, so I got to see all that stuff being made. Ewoks and droids, those were like the soft Star Wars 
cartoons before they made the really good ones, you know, like Clone Wars. But still, or it's like, that. like it's an essential. Yeah, I was gonna say Link in the Chain. But it's an essential cartridge in the Bandolier strip, if you will. Oh yeah, Ooh, oh, no. No. think about it. Nice like shot. right now, when you think about think about Star Wars in terms of Saturday Night Live. Sure. In the beginning, classic SNL, classic Star Wars. Right, that's, right. That's the religion. Mm-hmm. Then there's that period where nobody watched for a while, yeah. but somebody had to keep. The flames lit. Somebody had to keep the right. continuity moving forward, and that's what droids and Ewoks did. Like it's easy to shit on yeah. them now and be like, they're not the cartoons we know and love today. Yeah. But without that, you got nothing. It no. was like yeah. dead. You just had that holiday yeah. special, and yeah. nobody needs to just remember that. Right. 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 Yeah. Now some people will be like, well, I'd rather not have fucking droids and Ewoks if that's all we could have. But yeah. you're talking to people that were like in the trenches back in the day. We had Star Wars, yeah. Empire, Return of the Jedi. That was it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We didn't. And then we had toys, and we had to make the adventures ourselves. The aforementioned Christmas special. But other than <laughs> happy that, Happy Life Day, it, everybody. Oh, Happy Life Day. <laughs> yeah. But this was, or Unhappy Life Day. Yeah. But this was like an opportunity to watch the, the, the universe expand a little bit. Yeah. When you knew they weren't making any more new stuff. Like, yeah. I welcomed Ewoks and Droids. Yes. Ewoks definitely wasn't made for me. Right, right. But droids kind of was. Yeah. You know, and I enjoyed it for while I watched it, but that was right at the period where I'm like, I'm I'm holding up now. I'm, yeah. I'm in high school. Maybe Star Wars isn't as important or something like that. But that's, don't ever put that down. Oh, dude. no. That's, I mean, that's, you're part of the Star Wars fucking legacy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it put me in the same room with George Lucas in creative meetings, and I can't, you can't put a price on that. And we're sitting around going, can I use the bounty hunters and droids? And he goes, you mean like Boba Fett? And I said, yeah. And he goes, why do you think people like him? I go, this is badass. You don't know anything about him. And I said, it's the design of the helmet. It's that weird black T that goes down there. It's almost like that. And he was kind of like, huh, I guess so. Because he didn't know. He's just like, or we got to have another character. Okay, we'll come up with this guy. We'll put him in the cartoon uh, part of the holiday special. And suddenly it was lightning in a bottle. I don't even think he understood how how viscerally popular that design would become. And he it sort of mystified him, at least the time I was talking to him. I think he went back and saw what people liked about him and said, yeah, I'm going to. How old were you at the time? 24. Holy 24. Shit. And yeah. you're standing at the foot of the master yeah. who's made the trilogy of our youth. Yeah, yeah. So and I'll, extending his brand. Mm-hmm. So I'll go over and watch him film Tucker and Howard the Duck and all that shit. It was film You were there when he was doing Howard the Duck? Yeah, yeah. Was there a sense of hope like, this is it, we're cracking the comic book code? <laughs> there was, I have, but I have to admit, when I saw the costume, I went... Right away. Because I saw some sculptures where he looked like the Val Merrick, the early the Donald Duck one. Yeah, yeah. And what was really ironic was over at ILM, they were doing like the shading on Roger Rabbit. Single, you know? single him up, huge. Yeah, they, they, were, they, were, they were doing like the process on Roger Rabbit. And when I'd see the animation come in, I would go like, that, that's got to be Howard the Duck. No, not, not this guy in the costume, because you can see it, the, the fleshy part around the, the eyes. It looks like a mask. It looks like you couldn't fill it in, you know, mm-hmm. at least white it out a little bit. And they said, no, this is where we want to go with it. It's, it, it. It looks real to us. And I said, no, man, Roger Rabbit, that's that's a year away, and that's going to kick this thing's ass. And unfortunately, it did. You know, I, I think it just visually, it was just... <laughs> It was too out of step with what the, what everybody loved about the comic, with the incongruity of humans talking to a, a cartoon character. Remember so. the awkward scene with the duck prophylactic? <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, you know how people are like, I wouldn't bring my kid to Deadpool because I'd have to explain pegging. Try explaining duck fucking <laughs> and a duck rubber. You know, that was a PG-13 movie, or I don't I know if it was PG. What do you mean? Yeah. yeah. I was Trapped one, in a world he didn't make. There's one story I have to tell about Howard the Duck. Is like uh, when I was working up there, my sister Jane was always pissed at me. She goes, "Okay, Goonies came out. And you didn't take me to the premiere of that, and then Young Sherlock Holmes, and I didn't get to see that. Will you take me to the premiere of something?" I said, "Okay, well, you want to go see Howard the Duck?" And she goes, "Sure." So at the end of Howard the Duck, she just kind of looked at me and punched me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, flash forward, like I don't know how many years later, we we're going to see Guardians of the Galaxy, and we, and she, you want to see Guardians of the Galaxy? Yeah. And so she's really loving it loving all the way right up until the very end and when she sees Howard the Duck come on she goes (laughs) (laughs) she's still giving you shit about Howard the Duck you were right though time's gonna prove you right yeah Yeah. alright so after Ewoks and droids where do you make the move Uh, uh, at a weird little sideways uh, uh, excursion into trying to recreate Beanie and Cecil the Bob Clampett show with John Chris Felusi and Bruce Timms first time with John K John K Ren Stimpy's famous John K yeah because he had just come off working with um, 
Bakshi on Mighty Mouse. Mighty Mouse, yeah. the sniffing of the, the snorting of the flowers. Yeah. remember that? Yeah, oh yeah. They got in trouble for that. Yeah, and and uh, and then um, so he loves Bob Clampett, and he was very close to the Clampett family, and uh, he. Um, he, he came on to, to redo it, and boy, we were, ABC at the time just did not understand funny. They did not want to take a chance. CBS, at least, was taking chances with things like Pee Wee's Playhouse and a couple of other things, and ABC was just rigid, and they just wanted only the very a very puerile version of, okay, it's a kid and a sea serpent, and it's it's wacky and goofy. It's not really funny, mm. and it was just it was just a, a, a fatal combination. Like Chuck Lorre was a story editor, and they wouldn't let him be funny, and this was... Uh, you know, like he started off in animation, then he just said, you know, I, I can't deal with this. And he went off and, you know, did everything. He became an absolute him. failure, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I never, we never heard what of him a again. Bad move for him. And then uh, we were slogging away on Beanie and Cecil and Bruce. And that was the first time I worked with Bruce, was he was storyboarding Bruce directing Tim? some of those cartoons. Mm. Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. That's where you guys met before Warner Brothers? That's where we met before Warner Brothers. And then Beanie and Cecil exploded tremendously. Everybody got fired. You know, the show just imploded. Did um, they even make a single episode or no? They made five. Five episodes, and you can see some of them online. And um, you know, they're they're not bad, but they weren't what you know. You got these young guys who are really creative, and they're really at the time there was real no out, really no outfit outlet for them. There was no late night TV. There was no internet. Mm -hmm. There was no uh, Cartoon Network. So it's, if you wanted to do something, you had to go in and try and do it along Saturday morning lines. That's the only way they'd buy a cartoon from you. And But all these guys really wanted to do rude, exciting stuff that wouldn't exist for another 10 years. So it was just like the right talent at the wrong time. And right. all you had was like the Spike and Mike animation carnival yeah. or whatever it was at the yeah. time. Like super Which indie still cartoons. underground. Yeah, yeah, you had to go to a big city and see it. Yeah. Like and also the shit is expensive to do, so who's going to pay for it? That's, yeah. that's the other thing. You know, so you have to go where the money is and you know, sometimes you have to, if you want the stuff to get on TV, you know, tailor it down. But I, I remember going to lunch with John a couple of times. We'd sit there laughing our asses off over great gags that we wanted to put in these things. And they have to go back and pitch it to the network. And they just sit there like, you know, it would look like Mount Rushmore, all these stone faces. <laughs> and, and, and it's like, we don't get it. And um, so that imploded. And then uh, I got a call from Warner Brothers, like they were going to start up and they were going to do Tiny Toon Adventures so with Steven Spielberg. And uh, I had met some of those folks from working at Lucas, and they said, yeah, okay, why don't you come in? And All right, let's stop right there real quick yeah. and just acknowledge the fact that in the span of a couple of years, you worked with both George Lucas yeah. and then Steven Spielberg. One on, you know, extending his franchise yeah. with Joys and Ewoks. The other with reintroducing the Looney Tunes by way of younger characters to a whole new generation with yeah. his signature on it. Yeah, yeah. What the, f like, whose dick did you <laughs> fucking suck It's like to nerd get? Forrest Gump. It's, it's like exactly. wandering through awesomeness. Isn't, Isn't that what? crazy? Yeah, I feel like, you know, like the young Indiana Jones show where he meets <laughs> Louis Armstrong, he meets Teddy Roosevelt, he meets all these great figures of history, then he winds up at 90 years old, just this rant, you know, rant <laughs> that nobody remembers. Drunk it's, in that me. it's like, I am not an early twin. though, man. So what was Spielberg like to, like, were you there in a the room going, we want to do Plucky Duck? And he's like yes amazingly no. collaborative and and just so engaging and a lot of fun and he would come in and he really wanted to be a part of the process and he loves cartoons and uh have you ever been over to amblin to his office to the there? office yeah the office space there. it's just hung with animation and tremendous artwork and everything and he would come in and he, and he talks he talks a talk he, he can you can mention a cartoon and he'll go right to a scene where there's like emotional impact from any cartoon any cartoon he's seen and he truly loves them and so it was very easy to talk and pitch to him ideas and when he would say no he would say i don't want to do that because of this and so like okay great and he'd always point to a different direction so a lot of enthusiasm a lot of creativity a lot of support and um it was, it was a lot of fun working with him on on tiny tunes and i guess the last next time i worked with him a little bit was on freakazoid after that and some of the other stuff where but, did where did bruce go to warner brothers with you or you guys just happened to meet he was already well? there he was he, there yeah they had sort of put the call out after a uh, beanie and cecil imploded like um Warner's was going to be hiring because Steven had done Tiny Toon Adventures and he really loved getting his feet with, with the Warner Brothers characters. And he didn't really want to go back and try and remake Bugs and Daffy, but he said, let's try and do like a new generation with that same spirit. And Bugs and Daffy and, and everybody can be in it, but let's really try and come up with something else. So Tiny Toons got their feet warm and then Animaniacs mm -hmm. and Freakazoid and a bunch of other stuff and, and then his own stuff that he's doing now over at, uh, over at, over at DreamWorks. So how does that now... 
you do you win awards on on uh, Tiny Tunes? Some, yeah, yeah. I, I like won a Emmy couple. Joy. What? Emmy Joy? Did you have an Emmy night? Oh yeah, yeah. What? I got a couple of them. Uh, uh, the first one was uh, first time we won the Emmy was really great. Second time less so, but uh, it's, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's there upon hands in there. Um, uh, winning was fine, uh, and then and then after that. Uh, uh, we won for writing for Batman for the Mr. Freeze episode, which was the best one because I took my dad to the Emmys and, you know, it's like I, I, I had no idea and it was just like, uh, it's really great. How <laughs> awesome, man. Yeah. Pull an Emmy up in front of your dad. And yeah. You're like, yeah. It was, it, was, it was like a once in a lifetime thing. I was so happy. Tremendous. Yeah. All right, so wait a second. You're working on uh, Tiny Toons, mm -hmm. on Animaniacs, and then comes Batman. Is that when Batman happens? Yeah, Batman was was between um, was between uh, Animaniacs, Tiny Toons, and then and then Freakazoids. So we were working on Tiny Toons, and then Gene McCurdy said they're going to make a, they're going to make more Batman movies. We really want to do a series that kind of ties in, maybe not exactly to those movies, but kind of the feel and and the tone of that world. So she put the call out among the staff people to come up with with uh, takes. And I think Bruce went back to his office and he took 10 minutes and he drew up, drew up that, you know, that classic shot of Batman standing there. And she said, OK, you're on the show. And then Eric Radonsky came in and he'd done a background painting on black paper. And she said, that looks really great. And so they became the, um, the, the visual designers and the creators of the show. And I worked with Bruce on writing a Bible and uh, we got that kicked off. And then I then the show kind of was getting up on its feet. We didn't know when the show was going to start or anything. And Tiny Toons was starting up for another season and we were writing a home video. So I went back to do that. And then I left to write a movie for about half a year. And then so when I came, when Alan Burnett called me up, he had, he was, um, he'd come over from Hanna-Barbera to kind of run the writing over there. And I'd never met him before. And, and he said, uh, we would like to have you come back here and work on staff. And I said, I'm, I don't know if I'm up for it. And he goes, well, can you write some spec scripts for us? Because I like the development you did on Batman. So I wrote a couple of early scripts, and he liked those. And then he said, we come back full time. And I said, yeah, okay. Because by that point, he had kind of figured out what the show needed to be. There had been other writers who kind of came and went. And the show had gone alternated from being too not about Batman to too much of him as good old Batman. like. You know, so the show aired by that point, or was it still just they were seeing? Oh, cuts? that was about a year and a half away from right. before it ever hit air. Before it ever hit air, yeah. God, they were in development a long time. Yeah, the first thing that Bruce and Eric did was a real short little film of Batman surprising some thugs on top of a roof. You know, some mm. classic old style gangsters and Gordon coming up with a gun and chasing him off, and you see him fly away and everything. It was really stunning looking, and part of that same feel was incorporated into the title the sequence. Opening, yeah. And uh, but yeah, it took a while to get sorted out. At least a year and a half of scripting before we got to the the first air date. And um, was there a mandate to be even close to the movies or no? There, because this was between, yeah. if I remember correctly, mm. Batman happened, right? And then Batman <clears throat> Returns was about to happen. Is that when they said, "Hey, let's do a Batman show"? Oh. Somewhere between the two? Yeah, I think Batman Returns came out in the summer of. 92? 92, right. Mm -hmm. And we premiered that fall. Yeah. So On Fox, yeah. I, I, yeah. oddly enough. In prime time. I remember yeah. that. Yeah. So there were th certain things that we tried to incorporate, like the look of the penguin, the look of Catwoman, the fact that she was blonde in the movie, that, uh, that we made Selena Kyle blonde, at least at first. And there were certain visual cues that we took from there. and But mostly it was sort of be true to the tone of those movies, but go your own way. Mm -hmm. And so we tried to at least give some hints to, you know, visually to that world. Now, you've told the story a zillion times, and for those, you know, you've got to assume this is every comic book is somebody's yeah. first comic book. Mm -hmm. The How does Harley Quinn come into play? Because that's, you're working on a lot of characters right. that existed. That's a character, a whole cloth created just for this show. Right, right. Um, well, you know, Harley was not part of the the DC Universe before that, of course, and she wasn't even part of the development that we had come up with originally. Uh, I, had, I was writing a few freelance episodes for Alan Burnett, and I was writing this one called Joker's Favor, where a guy, you know, kind of crosses paths with the Joker, and then, you know, it's the Joker, you know, kind of preying on an ordinary guy just because it's sort of funny. And I had to give the Joker some henchmen, and I thought, what about a girl? And, you know, what kind of a character should she be? Should she be, like, just a rank-and-file hench person, or should she be funny, like, on the... Adam West show, and I and I like the idea of somebody who would kind of make jokes, 
and kind of piss the Joker off, but he would have her around for some reason. And, you know, and a cute girl is always fun. So I came up with uh, the character and I named her Harley Quinn because I thought, oh, well, that keeps with the clown motif. And um, I remember I even did a rough design. Bruce Tim looked at it and went like, you, okay, I'm, I think we can do better. And uh, they actually made a figurine out of that uh, last year. Of your year. first draw, yeah. of your original drawing? Yeah, so I, I, when I was drawing her, I was going like, well, uh, okay, if this was 1960, Barbara Eden would probably be playing like the girl henchman role, like Jill St. John or something. So I came up with a blonde and a miniskirt, and Bruce was just like, wow. And then he drew the Harley, thank God, that we all know and love. And, um, and so then uh, she was in that episode, and she was... People liked her. They thought she was sort of funny. She didn't detract from the Joker. Mm -mm. And then we began doing some more episodes, and it's like, let's drop her out of a couple because we don't want her to, you know, we don't want, if she's, we see too much of her, she's going to get really irritating. So every, you know, two or three episodes, she'd show up, and people liked her. The directors liked her. And it's sort of like Bugs Bunny. Nobody really thinks I'm going to, the character is all born, you know, saying, what's up, Doc? Doc and all his catchphrases and everything. She evolved a little bit over time, and I think that she really became crystallized about a year after we got on the air, Bruce and I sat down to write the Mad Love story, and uh, and then a lot of her backstory came up, and and you know a lot of the uh, pathos and the dimension with the character. Let's talk about that real quick. So, Mad Love was DC saying, "Hey, do a comic book." Right. Exactly. So they approached you, or you approached them? They approached. Uh, they approached us. And, I mean, it was it was very casual. It was uh, we had gone back there uh, early on in the development stages to New York. Bruce and I had taken a trip back there. Uh, to look at, you know, to talk to D.C. And, and get some ideas just wandering around the city looking at, uh, you know, the architecture and, and everything and what we might incorporate from that. And then, um, uh, so th I think the door was always open. Denny O'Neill and Mike Carlin and Paul Levitz and everybody there was very open to the idea because uh, we had we'd shown that we were very collaborative and we appreciated a lot and of true the Batman. And source book. material. Yeah, yeah, like, exactly. you guys weren't like, here's a fuck your grandpa's Batman, this is new Batman. Like, yeah. you guys reached into their toy box and played with all of their toys yeah. and played with them well, did them justice. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so they said, yeah, if you want to, you know, come up with something. So we came up with a mad love story. And, uh, you know, Had you ever done any comic stuff before then? I'd or? done one or two little things here and there. I had done, uh, you know, a friend of mine had a, you know, ran, started a black and white company called Claypool Comics, and he did an Elvira comic book. So I wrote an issue for him, you know, and a few little things here and there. And then, but Harley, uh, the Mad Love Story was the first thing that I, the first DC job that I ever did. And it was like, oh, talk about, you know, a lucky fluke. You know, <laughs> not, not, not a bad Jesus. way to start. No, no. I mean, Bruce worked his, his, his uh, put his heart and soul into that. You know, it was, he was he was drawing every night and, and coloring and he did all the color models on it and everything. And uh, and he would come in the next day with these pages and he'd been up all, all night, you know, drawing and, and, and inking and everything. And I think it was like a, a learning process for him because he had done some comic book work before, but ne nothing on this, on this uh, level. And so we just, you know, we made it as good as we could and, you know, it was, everybody, everybody liked it. Now so. what happens, like, did you feel an instant impact with Mad Love? Because it's kind of historic. Like, the characters in the cartoons, and that's all fine and good, and she became very popular there, but, like, Mad Love, inst no, this sounds weird to say, but institutionalized her in a weird yeah. way. Even before DC said, she's officially part of our universe, mm -hmm. which would happen, like, yeah. a couple years later. Right. I, I remember the reverberations of Mad Love, of people being like, oh, my God, this yeah. is... This book mm -hmm. is seriously like it's it's done in a very cartoony style in Bruce's style, right? But it's like a seriously well told story, you know. Right. It kind of blew away everything that was in vogue at the moment. Like, and it sure. was a, it was a book you could give your girlfriend, yes. right? Right. You know? And yeah. because the Bruce's art is so clean and so yeah. crystal, and the storytelling is so pure, there was yeah. never any barriers for entry. Yeah. That's that's yeah. why my kid yeah. is named Harley Quinn. Is yeah. I gave my then girlfriend, now wife Jennifer, a copy of Mad Love, and I have a picture of her. She's in a tub. Reading it, I took a creepy, took a picture <laughs> back in the '90s when you weren't supposed to do that either. So, but you know, she's sitting there reading "Mad Love in the Tub." She got out of the tub and she was like, "Harley Quinn would be a great name for a kid if we ever have a kid." Like, yeah. oh, okay, and we did have a kid and yeah. became Harley Quinn. But you're right; I was able to give. She was not a, a genre fan. Mm -hmm. She didn't read comics or anything. She's familiar with like the big ones, but. Yeah. You know, she was like, you're always talking about comic books. Do you have something I could read? And I was like, I do. Yeah. And that was perfect. Yeah. Like, you know, I couldn't hand her Dark Knight Returns as a commitment. Mm -hmm. But this was like, well, let's see if you dig this. And she dug it enough yeah. to name it. Like every now and again, you find like the sexually transmitted comics 
where yeah. it's just like, hey, look, Sandman, give that a read. Yeah, yeah. Why the Last Man, give that a read. Yes. Mad Love was like, hey, you like Batman, you know what this is, read this. Preacher, Misty they're... Loves Preacher. Yeah, yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah, They're all inclusive. Yeah. That's the yeah. thing, too. It's not like, here's a story about that one guy doing all those things. It's <laughs> yeah. like, this is a story about the Joker's girlfriend, but yeah. she's the main character, and the Joker's mm-hmm. almost secondary. Yeah. Everything about it is intriguing. They're like, where's Batman? And he's, he's in it a few times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really about her. You created the anti-heroine in many ways. Yeah. You know, with, with Harley Quinn. You know, and it's it's so cinematic in a lot of ways. I mean, Bruce is a phenomenal storyboard artist and, and a director, and there were just so many touch, touches that you'd expect to see in a movie, like when the Joker is, when he, she calls up the Joker, you know, the, she says that she's trapped Batman, he goes, you have uh, uh, Batman, huh? And he's like looking through his plans and he goes, uh huh, okay, uh huh. And then the next panel, he's screaming, You have who tied up where? And the next panel isn't him running out or anything, it's an old man being run over in the street by a speeding car, <laughs> which is a great visual cut. It's like a cut out of an action movie that would just go to that and it just sort of carries you from one panel to another. You don't need any dialogue, and, it, and it's just, you know, that's the way he thinks. And it's just, you know. It, 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 it made it. It gave it a magic all its own. So, so the character takes off. The show has taken off. What yeah. do you do? What do you follow? Batman the animated series. You did Batman Robin Adventures, but then yes. Batman Beyond follows that. Yeah, um, we have done uh, Batman and Robin Adventures, then Superman, and then uh, Superman. Superman. That's right. Yeah, man. So Superman. Who, who from Batman went to Superman? The whole crew. Pretty much the whole crew. And, uh, and God, I love that run too, man. That was yeah. the Brainiac story. Yeah, it was like yeah. made Brainiac cool. Yeah, you did two villains. I mean, you did all of everything yeah. you wrote. You did Justice on, but you did two corny ass villains. Real <laughs> justice in those both those series. Mr. Freeze yeah. in Batman, like yeah. you redefine him and turn him yeah. into a Shakespearean well, level tra- tragic character. And then in the other one, Superman was Brainiac. Yeah. Brainiac was always like, he's, yeah. he's the he space Lex Luthor. Luthor. Exactly. Yeah, I never knew what he was before in, until you, that one. You yeah. made him fucking badass. Mm-hmm. Like, that's a cool backstory of like, I collect, I'm the repository of all knowledge of the planet. Right. And I get that knowledge and then make sure that planet. Dies. Yeah. Like it's yeah. perfectly villainous, yeah. but also also like kind of logical. You're like, oh, he's just yeah. he's just a computer kind of. And he was created out of the Kryptonian's hubris. Like, okay, you know, Brainiac will solve all our problems. Oh yeah, he'll solve his problems. He's gonna get his ass out of there while you blow yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, such a great series. All right, so who went over from Batman animated Superman? Uh, quite a lot of folks. Uh, Eric had left at that time. Uh, I, Alan Burdett and I had gone over there. Some of the writers had gone over there. A lot of the des- we had had a lot of new designers who'd come on. Uh, during the run of, of, of Batman, they went over there. Um, Bruce wanted to rethink the visual style, which is why he changed the style for the new Batman adventures, because he wanted the two worlds to look together, to, to work together. He felt like to, re- to go in and design Superman, that's going to be a brighter palette, a more streamlined design. And so he redesigned a lot of the Batman characters to fit into that world. Uh, a little better, and that's why I came up with the the, the you know more elegant, streamlined, more uh, optimistic design of Metropolis. So you're saying that like a character who's like kind of light and sunny and bright, yeah, and a character who's a little dark shouldn't necessarily be in the dark world. They should kind of meld a little bit better, maybe, well, he, possibly. I don't know. Where are you getting at, Zack Snyder? <laughs> no, nothing. I'm just, I'm just saying that maybe not everything needs to be. Well, what was great about that is like the, the Warner's really let him rethink. You know everything. They could have said, "No, no, just stick to the model sheets. We've done this. We have toys that look like this. Just, just stay the course." It's like, "No, you want to re- redo it? Go, go ahead. You know, make a vision of Batman that fits in with the new Superman world." And everything has sort of evolved, you know, since then, for, because the look of Justice League is slightly different, and then the looks of some of the directed videos that he's doing is slightly different than that. I mean, you can all, you know, trace it back. Mm. But you know, you look at the early Bugs Bunny cartoons, the early cartoons that. Tex Avery did, or nothing like the later ones that Chuck. Chuck he doesn't even look did. like Bugs Bunny. As a kid, you'd watch him and be like, "That must be Bugs Bunny's cousin." That's not, <laughs> clearly not yeah. Bugs Bunny. Phil Bunny. Yeah, Bunny. Yeah. Yeah. Bunny. yeah, yeah. The uh, okay, so you go from Superman to Justice League to Batman Beyond, right? Then, when did you leave the DC universe? What did you do after that? You created Jingle Bell. Oh yeah, for for comics character. and ever and everything, and then um, at Warner Brothers. Uh, I, st- um, I, st- um, I came to kind of like, uh, I, w- I was a little tired of the men in capes. Mm. And I love the Looney Tunes, so 
they were going to do Duck Dodgers, and I jumped on that. And that's I worked right. with you, the, the Duck, that's the Duck only Duck reason Duck. I got to be in Duck Dodgers. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That was a lot <laughs> that was of fun. Al Jordan, for yeah, yeah, there you go. And that was that was a lot of fun, you know, to work with Spike Grant and Tony Cervoni and just go back and and do our take on you know classic Looney Tune uh, uh, short. And that was a lot of fun. And uh, and then the business kind of changed. You know, the new people came in running the studio and. Uh, the writers' deals changed, and it was it got a little harder to to be there. So I had an opportunity to go off and uh, work on the first season of Lost. So I just said, "Well, I gotta," which is not a bad first season. No, of yeah. 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 Like, and do you think that's the pedigree? Like, well, how'd you wind up on Lost? They're like, "Man, we love your episodes on Batman." It was something. You know what happened was, you know, Brian Burke, you know, works, yeah, yeah and uh, works with JJ. He, uh, I had met him through our good friend David Mandel, and uh, he. Um, and he always liked me and said, uh, you know, you got kind of a weird skew and everything. You know, you've got a weird imagination and everything. And uh, we're doing the show about people trapped on an island. Do you want to? And we need writers with kind of out there imaginations to kind of make a leap of faith. You might have a job for a year. You might be off in, in three weeks. But you, you want to come over and, and meet everybody? So I came over and I talked to Damon Lindelof. And JJ was there that day. And we all got to talking. And... About a week later, Damon called up and said, yeah, I'd like to have you join this group of writers. We're going to develop the show. And so while he w and JJ were writing the pilot, the other three writers and I were kind of coming up with ideas and pitching them to JJ and Damon about the uh, about the characters and the island and everything. So you were the development of Smoke Monster, of like all that season one stuff? Well, yeah, a little bits here and there. I mean, you know, the monster was something that they had cooked up and everything, but defining certain things about the island and certain characterizations. I remember we, um, one day we all uh, wrote down the names of all the characters and we put them in a hat and everybody drew three names and it's like okay for the next two nights you're going to be writing nothing but these characters go home and define these three characters so i drew sawyer Locke, and son and i took them home and i wrote all this you know everything i could think of about these characters that we had discussed in the office and added a bunch of stuff and uh we all came in and pitched them and then everybody kind of swapped characters and we all you know kind of Gave it a shot, and, and, and then ultimately JJ and Damon made the uh, made the final call on on them, and and then it wasn't even until like they were actually shooting some of the episodes, it would be like, oh, I got a great idea. What if Locke never stands up? We never see his legs, and, and then we reveal he's been in a wheelchair all this time. So that was, you know, Damon brought in this this great idea, which was sort of like a, a total surprise, you know, right. and uh, and a lot of stuff was thought of that way, like uh, you know, all the, the the real the quick turns and everything. Because once we'd sort of established, here's the meat and potatoes of it, they would come in and they'd add everything else to it. I mean, right. most TV writers go their entire careers never working on a show that has any cultural impact, like at all, to be able to have Batman. On one hand, <laughs> and then fucking lost on the other hand. Yeah, like come on, dude. That's like he ain't even done influence in the culture. My I friend. know, Watch but this. like video games. Oh, what? Come on. tell him which video games you worked on because you know we're old men, so it's all movies and cartoons. Yeah. And television. Take your critical vision back to your room. Yeah, yeah but these kids today—they're all about the Batman, this and the yeah. Arkham, that and stuff. What did you work on? Well, there was the ET Atari. That was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but after after that, I uh, uh, I did the Arkham games, so uh -huh. the Arkham Asylum. And Let's talk more about ET. <laughs> yeah, that sounds interesting. Yeah. Let's all go out to the landfill. Were you there for the first Arkham game? Uh, yeah. yeah so from which was what? Arkham Asylum. And then uh, I was working with Rocksteady, and I got over to England to meet them, and, and it was it was really <laughs> terrific, you know, working with them and with uh, the, the crew of artists over there. And then after that came Arkham City. Excuse me. Get a little excited, and um, and that was another. It was like writing an animated feature. It was like two or three years of of just working on on the on the project, writing and rewriting. And I would work, you know, for the space of like about a year, just writing, you know, all the little things. Like you know, Batman runs down a hall and talks to a guard. Which way did he go? That way, Batman. Then I rewrite the same way. Have you seen the Joker? Yes, he's over here. You know, and so you're writing the same thing over and over, and trying to add a little bit to it because they've got to animate all all the various choices you can make. So how long of a draft? Is it to write a game like that? Oh. Is there ever a one full draft? Like, do they ever put it in front of you and be like, "There's your script"? Yeah, I mean, it's like like one of those reams of paper you buy at uh, oh, Staples or something <laughs> like that. It's it's just 500 pages.
pages or something. Oh, holy and shit. then they go through the recording and they have to record everything. Poor Kevin Conroy must be shot for a week after uh, <laughs> recording all the different Batman, uh, you know, of the different Batman lines and everything. It was fun. It was fun seeing it all come together. It was fun seeing it play out. And people said, how long did it take you to finish the games? It's like, I've never finished a game because I just like going and being Batman. I'll just swing from building to building. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I know the story. Yeah. I just city's quiet around. tonight. <laughs> That's gonna, dope. Maybe man. I'll drive the car for a bit. <laughs> you know, so that was fun. Yeah. So did you do all three of them? No. Or uh, you did they, Arkham Asylum and Arkham City? They did Arkham Origins, which was done by um, a game company in Canada. And then mm. they did Arkham Knight. Is the Arkham Knight, yeah. No, I wasn't involved with that one. Gotcha. So, what story. is that? So when are you done writing the video game? Because don't they upgrade games and shit? Like, so would you have to be like, if they ever did an upgrade package, you're like, I have to write a few more lines when he meets a random or something like that? Yeah, no, they have they have uh, writers on staff to do that. There was a I worked with a very good writer who was there in charge of Rocksteady's um, story development, a Paul, uh, Paul Crocker, hmm. and he uh, and I would. Um, run things by each other a lot and uh, I would write all the drafts and give them to him and he would go through and do some rewriting and changes and he'd write stuff as well but he was there on staff so he was in their in-house guy so whenever there was an expansion package or you know like Harley Quinn's Revenge or something like that he would write that or, or he and his team would do it I was, I was there mostly for the big picture stuff and for a lot of the uh, the cutscene dialogue and a lot of you know at least the first two a lot of in in game mm. in game stuff. Now we're on the verge, not the very eve, but like in the summer, Suicide Squad's going to happen. Yeah, and Harley no longer belongs to you, no longer belongs to me and him. Yeah, she belongs to everybody. My mom, well, my yeah. mom knows Harley Quinn's name because yeah. of her granddaughter, but <laughs> everybody's mother going to know Harley Quinn yeah. at this point yeah. as much as they know Batman and the Joker. Yeah. You've added fucking spoke to the wheel. Uh -huh. Most people jump in there, they play with what exists. It's, right. it's a rich enough tapestry uh -huh. where you don't even feel the need to bring shit to it. Like when right. I went to write from him, I just want to play with your characters. <laughs> but you brought a character into the mix that now stands shoulder to shoulder with characters that are 50, 60, sometimes 70 years old. Yeah. How does that fucking feel, dude? When do you drop the mic or do you like, there's more I want to do? Oh, nowhere near dropping the mic. I mean, you know, it, it's it, Harley Quinn's a start for me. I mean, you know, I want to just keep going and create other stuff you know, and my own characters and characters for other people. And I just, uh, the greatest thing about Harley Quinn is that it, it gave me a lot of confidence as a creator and say like, hey, I can do this, you know, whether I work with really talented collaborators or if I go off and, and try and do something on my own. I may not be able to hit the bullseye ever again in my life, but at least I'll, I'll keep trying. So, and that's that's the best thing about, uh, about her. But I, I'm, I love it that people have embraced the character so much. When I see, you know, uh, little girls come up to the house at Halloween and they're dressed like Harley Quinn. It, it, it's so gratifying. And when I see their dads dressed the same way, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> man, that's wonderful. Yeah, God bless you, Dad. Here's three more Snickers bar for, for you. You, you, got, you. You got what the character like, is go about. Go to your hips, so yeah. watch out. <laughs> As one of the dads, do yeah. you have a, a reaction to, a, like, First time I saw Harley in an Arkham game when yeah. she wasn't dressed like Harley Quinn yeah. from the cartoon, yeah. I was like, what the? I yeah. got prim and proper. Yeah, yeah. Like suddenly, like, this is too much. This is, have you, have you ever reacted to an incarnation of Harley Quinn where you're like, this goes too far? Uh, no, not really. I mean, early on I would, I, uh, you know, I, I went to a couple of conventions and I'd be in Artist Alley and I'd see... Uh, artists who would do thing, various commissions of the characters and the lewd ones, right? Yeah, yeah, I've and, seen those too. And some of those, I, I might have bought one or two. <laughs> thought, to be honest with you, before I had the kid, but I was yeah. like, oh, that's hot. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's fine, you know. Whatever, you know, whatever people like is great. It's, but I like. I have seen a lot of guys dressed up like Harley. And Harley is very liberating. They all say, "I love being Harley Quinn because she's." kind of goes beyond just a, a you know a female character and she's sort of the sprite that embodies I'll just do whatever the hell I want and the, and the hell with anybody else and that's terrific and so I you know I can't be one of those guys who gets like he creates something and then for the rest of my career saying oh I did that one big thing and I'm really sour over it and it's like no you know the character's not really in my head anymore she's out there she's mm. out for everybody and I, and I and I think that's great you know so everybody enjoy alright so you now know? what we did was told you about 
Paul's very massive career so that we could get to talking about what Paul's doing right now. Mm -hmm. You you see this? Kids, this is what they call a comic book. Yep. This is where the movies and television shows (laughs) that you (laughs) love so much come from this source material. On the next episode of Fat Man Batman, we're going to talk about this. This is Paul's latest book, and I guarantee Paul's won some 10. We heard about some Emmys. We won some Annies. Yep. What else you want in this world? Uh, uh, Mm -hmm. Emmys, Annies, uh, Mm -hmm. Eisner's. Eisner's uh, Eisner's as well. Writers Guild Award. God damn it. All right. He's going to add another award with this book. I guarantee it, man. We're going to talk about it on the very next episode of Fat Man on Batman. Come back, man. You'll see me, Kevin Smith, and him. Mark Menarden. Same fat time. Same fat channel. What's it called? YouTube.com slash Kevin Smith. It's me, Kevin Smith. Thanks for watching. Do me a favor. Click that thing below that says subscribe. Every time you click that, you save a baby kitten from murder.